Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Backer, and welcome to Write Better Stories, the podcast where we discuss the Iraq War. Today, joining me is Samantha Steinmetz, actor, director, writer, producer, best boy, he grip, many, many different creative hats you've worn in your creative career. Um, yeah. But I just needed to get that introduction out of the way. So how's it going? Yay! Uh, oh, hey! Um, I, I just, I, I meant to say great and hey at the same time, and it came out as gay! Hey. Um, I'm good, I'm good. I'm um, doing as well as can be right now, you know. Ooh. Um, I put on my L.L. Bean flannel for this. Okay, are you camping? Are you on a jog in the suburbs? No, this is just my nice outfit now. Oh, I see. That was my third guess that I, I <laughs> didn't have time to say. Yeah, I don't know. I'm good. Yeah, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, I, uh, I'm here in my parents' basement right now, which most mm -hmm. people consider the pinnacle of success. Yeah. And as I told you, I'm moving to New York in August. That's exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, other than that, yeah, I'm just doing this YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, what, what's new with you? you? You guys moved out of New York, right? Yeah, um, we moved, which is crazy. But uh, we bought a house in the Hudson Valley. And this has always been a dream of ours. But we just thought it was the right time to do this. And we traded a, a rent for a mortgage. And we're just living this life. And um, all of our auditions are self-tape right now. Eventually, we'll probably get a, an apartment in the city uh, if we can. That's the dream. Um, okay. And then, you know, be able to work uh, mostly from here in the Hudson Valley and then have a crash pad uh, when we need it for work. Um, as soon as things start picking back up again, you know, because our industry has been pretty much shut down for a while now, but production is starting again, which is excellent. That is good news. Um, and th that has been kind of the refrain for most of the performers that I've spoken to, because like a lot of people in different creative avenues, other than performing, at least have something to do right now. But um, how have you been coping with that? Because acting is your main thing, if I understand correctly. So it is. Yeah. I mean, I have like another little side gig, which is computer related. And that's something I've always done. But I'm doing a little bit of that right now. Um, but with no, but acting's my main, like, that's my job. That's my main source of income. And it's also what makes me happy. So yeah, it's been really challenging. I mean, I'm, I'm not alone. We're all kind of going through this moment of who are we, if we don't have the thing that always, uh, was our main identifying factor, so I've been, I mean, my God, I've started painting again. I've been painting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that's something I loved to do years ago. And I started doing that again. I'm terrible. I'm a, I'm a terrible painter, but I love it so much. And it makes me happy. And what else have I been doing? I've been making clay uh, jewelry and uh, pottery. And I've been learning how to sew and bake bread and garden and um, what else? I feel like there, I have like a lot of these little quarantine hobbies that I've picked up and um, they're all very weird. Oh, bird watching. I'm a huge, I like huge, that's my thing now. Really? Well, I'm obviously a big fan of uh, birds and uh, you know, Pringle here is, is definitely one of my friends on the channel for that um but that, i mean that's that's quite a lot of stuff to have picked up all in, in this time i imagine you had some experience with some of that before this right or is this yeah. all just new sammy I, during the pandemic new sammy no i've always i've always been interested in in too many things for my own good that's why i'm like an actor because i wanted to be so many other things and i was like well i'll just pretend to be all those things but um yeah it's this is definitely intensified a lot of these interests of mine in terms of like, I've gotten very serious about painting and drawing. And I think I'm, I'm 
going to take a class and uh I, I you know it's it's yeah I don't I, I sound I'm very I, I sound very um like the stereotypical artist right now but that's kind of what I'm doing to stay sane well this is this is something that's just been on my mind a lot recently of yeah. committing to too many things and not letting anything be a hobby because I think I still have this kind of like childish mentality in me that I could be you know picked up by um some professional toothbrusher or something like that if I don't you know completely commit to brushing my teeth hard enough and so like yeah. I, I feel like I'm I'm working myself into insanity right now trying to like keep all of these plates spinning that I think was feasible at one point in my life and it's just not anymore but I can't let it go do you deal with that at all Oh yeah, absolutely. No, you're articulating exactly what I, what I go through, but I think in practicing things that I'm not talented at, it helps me to release a lot of that obsession or pressure that I put on myself uh, for it to be something. Uh, so yeah, so painting is a perfect example of that. Like, I, I feel like I should go, well, I have this one painting of my dog that's very bad that I did of my dog, Ruthie. And I accidentally misspelled her name on her little collar. So it says Ruti without the H and that was an accident. So um, I'm very, very bad. Uh, and also I can't spell, but like, these are things in doing that stuff. It just kind of exercises that this is supposed to be creative and for lack of a better word, fun. And it does not have to please anybody or be accepted by anybody. And I think it's fantastic. So, you know, fuck what everybody else thinks. That's yeah, that's a good point. Well, that I think it's something that I've struggled with in the past too, of like, I'm in fact, I'm still doing it now. Like I just, I just got into like building this synthesizer right now. And it's a very complicated instrument that'll probably take me years to play with any kind of competence. And I'm already like, okay, well, I need to upgrade my video equipment so that I can start posting tomorrow. And like, you know, I really need to build this aspect of my career. And I hear it and like objectively, I'm like, oh, this is not good. Like I should not have posted this video. It's not so bad that it's like embarrassing, but I'm just like, I could probably get further with it if I just chilled on it a little bit and was like, okay, I don't need to like equate success on it with posting it and like showing it to the world, you know? Exactly. Right. Cause it's not for anybody else ever. Like art is not for other people. I'm, that sounds terrible, but you're doing it as a form of self-expression and you hope that in that self-expression, other people can take some, find something in it and take something that benefits their life in whatever way. If it's, you make them laugh or you make them think about something in a new way or remember a relationship that encourages them to reach out 10 years after not speaking to each other. Like it, it, there are so many ways in which I've been affected by art. And the dream is to be on the other side of that and create something that has any sort of impact on someone else even though it's, it comes from the self and it's for the self, if that makes any sense. Oh, it does. It's just like a, a tough paradox to navigate, I think, because mm -hmm. it is one of those things that it's like, if you do want to truly please everybody else, you have to like totally put on the blinders and not worry about that. And then I think for you, especially like acting is something that makes that even more challenging because you are technically mm -hmm. stepping outside of yourself in order to create some sort of character or some sort of performance that is like intended to have an audience. So can you think of any times where you've maybe gotten into trouble with yourself creatively for like trying to emulate something or like play to the audience in a way that it didn't work out? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely guilty of chewing the scenery. I've, I've done that before where like, uh, I, I'm trying so desperately to get a laugh that I will reach for everything that I can possibly think of in order to get a certain reaction. And that's, I've learned the hard way. Um, you're, you're dead in the water when you start to do that. But uh, yeah, I think I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. I feel like when you are trying to control someone's action or reaction uh, in the art world, that it's um, 
you're doing the opposite of what you should be doing, which is releasing any uh, concern of um, what the audience is feeling or what they're going through. This is so hard to articulate. I've never actually had to articulate this before. Uh, so yeah, I think sometimes I, I try too hard. I try too hard and, uh, and it ends up coming off as chewing the scenery and, and uh, focusing too much on audience reaction as opposed to what I'm trying to get done in the scene. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. that and like, I, I think I've learned that lesson the most in putting all my eggs in one basket in some scene of something and being like, okay, this is the one that everybody's just gonna lose their mind over and everybody's like, yeah, that was fine. And then they end up like really glomming onto something that you didn't even really care about or think about. Right. And so it, it just, it basically does reaffirm that. But like what, when you were saying that, it also kind of reminded me, and I don't want to project this on you, but I'm curious to see if you uh, agree with this, is do you feel like there's something in your like Midwestern mentality that gives you that sort of like, well, by golly, I'm going to make them like me. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. I'm, I'm, Oh God. There's a lot of that. I mean, have you watched Ted Lasso yet uh, with Jason no, Sudeikis? It's so it's like this new Apple TV show. Jason Sudeikis stars in it and he plays this American football coach who is hired by a uh, British uh, football team, like football, football, soccer team. And he goes over there and the whole thing is his, th this comedy, dramedy really of this uh, guy from Kansas trying to coach a soccer team full of all these like burly guys. And I think of, uh, I empathize a lot with Jason Sudeikis's character because he is so, uh, he's such a people pleaser, but he's also so determined uh, in his optimism. And I feel like that's something that I, I have gotten a lot from my Kansas upbringing is I can be optimistic to the point of overconfidence. And it's a constant remind, I just have to remind myself constantly to uh, take it down a few notches that I, I need to remind myself to be humble uh, because I started out 10 years ago being so insecure and thinking I had nothing to offer and no talent and yada, yada, yada. And it took me years and years and years to work through that stuff. And that now I'm kind of on the other end of, of this. I've gone too far and now I'm trying to balance out and, uh, you know, how can I be confident and humble at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another, like, interesting contrast that's definitely hard to navigate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and it's, it's just funny, too, because, like, I don't think of you as overly insecure or over, like, wh wh what is your overconfidence, like, come back to bite you? Or is it just, like, a, a kind of internal thing that... I mean, like, it, it comes back to bite me only internally, because I, I try to, like, not let it affect my actions towards other people. But you know, like sometimes I'll have a really good audition and I'll be like, oh man, they would be crazy not to hire me. Like what? I, I, they would be hard pressed to find someone to do this as well as I can do it. And then, but there's always that little, that factor that's okay. Yeah, that's true. Like you, you know, the way you did it is the best version of the way you did it, but that's not what they're looking for. And they're going to go with whatever else they needed for whatever reason. So I can't tell you how many times I've felt that way about an audition and I don't book it. I mean, in the hundreds of times. Oh, and uh, yeah, because this is what I do. Like I just audition all the time and have been for, for a long time now. So that's when it comes back to bite you is you, you, you get so, oh my gosh, that was, that was, mm, that was beautiful. Like you can get a little too wrapped up in the work you do that it creates, you get too cocky and then you have to take yourself down a little bit because you don't book the role. And then you have to remember that you're just a working actor and, you know, not just, but that that's what you do. You are a working actor and rejection is part of the job. All right. So in your process then from feeling so insecure and like you said, you had nothing to offer into becoming confident. Like, where do you feel like that insecurity came from? Because this is something that I think <clears throat> almost every creative person, whether they admit it or not, especially when they're starting, 
goes through these ups and downs of being like, mm-hmm. I'm next level, nobody can touch me to being like, I shouldn't even do this anymore. I'm wasting my time. So oh, yeah. like, where, do, where do you feel like that insecurity comes from? And like, uh, if you could psychoanalyze yeah. yourself. Well, I, this is why I think teachers are so important and like imp- uh, mentors at a young age. I had an extraordinary high school drama teacher by the name of Dan Schmidt, who has since passed away, sadly, but he, I, I promise I'll answer your question. He was the first person to ever believe in me and to really set me up for success and challenge me. And it's just an extraordinary thing to have people who see something in you, whatever that may be and try, or don't but but regardless they try to make you a better version of yourself and I, I anyway thank god for teachers they're the best we could talk about that for hours and hours um but i, I think the insecurity comes from just a place of of uh for me personally who am i what what, what who am i to be saying that i have the right to do something like this with my life i should get a real job i should really contribute to society, all of these little uh, false statements that you tell yourself uh, from an early age, uh, because it's not normal to make a living creating art. That's not really a normal thing. And a lot of it is luck, like you have to just get lucky, but um, uh, a lot of society will tell you that you need to le- live your life a certain way. And a lot of times uh, a creative life is not within those confines. Yeah, I mean, that, that resonates a lot. And I think especially <laughs> harking back to that Midwestern mentality, I think that there is a like a, a belief here that like, oh, who do you think you are? You, oh, you think you're so special that you can yeah. do that. You think you're better than us or something like that. Yeah. And, I, I've gaslit myself with that as well of, of yeah. being like, you must be very grandiose to think that you could do this or to, right. to like pursue anything outside of the norm like that. And yeah. so were, were you going to say something? It looks like you're. No, I mean, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm like, like you're, that's exactly what you're, you're articulating it very well. Cause it's just like, uh, who are you to, to do this kind of thing because there's so many actors that I look up for and I'm like oh my god you you know like Angela Bassett you could never you could never and and that is true because she's absolutely extraordinary but those types of voices just don't serve you at all because there's a place for everybody in in your in the chosen industry or creative field uh that you want to go into that's my belief I almost feel like it's kind of like a defense mechanism too. It's it's kind of like a humble, uh, a humble way of excusing yourself from really being vulnerable and putting yourself out for it. Totally, yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, it's such an easy it's an easy way to pour all of your creative energy into something, into crying on the floor, being like, "I'll never be an actor," which was me. And it, it, it's just, but it's just a waste of time because you could be using that energy towards actually making stuff and turning out some, turning out some really cool work. So, you know, stuff, it's, it's just trying, how do you find that middle ground? How do you go not do the thing where it's like, oh my God, I'm so amazing. I should book it. And oh my God, I'm shit. I'm not worthy of any of this. It's just like, it's, then you don't experience as much of the high and the low. It's, it's a, the more sane way to live your life as an artist. Think. Oh, oh yeah yeah or like that's what I tell myself when I feel like total shit about what I'm doing with my life <laughs> yeah same. yeah I think same. I think it is that that like middle way definitely because it it it's weird because you do get cocky and I've, I've seen this with myself more than anything with music that like probably when I was around like 23 I was like I get it I just know everything there is to know and yeah. then I hit like one of the biggest plateaus in my life shortly after that where I was just like, I, I cannot create music anymore. And I thought I was done. I literally like quit technically, but then ironically, like after I gave myself permission to quit, I, I became inspired again. Cause it just like totally destroyed all of the illusions that I had that I was like arrived already. And it made yeah. me realize that like, even though I was like capable of some kind of things, I, I just got like an overinflated opinion of my abilities. And I didn't think I had any more to learn. 
Totally. Cause that's when it becomes about other people. Right. So like my example of my version of your story is like, I booked a job and I did the job and it aired and it got a the super positive reaction. Everybody was messaging me. People were talking about this and I felt so good about myself. I was just like, Oh, from here on out, like I'm only going to produce that level of work and that kind of role, like that level of role. And then of course, since then I've done much smaller stuff and, and have not received a reaction like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, it was like, how do I do these roles that are smaller as some people would say, and still be able to enjoy my time on set and really have a good time because this is what I'm choosing to do with my life. And I feel like I've done a pretty good job at that because even this, this most recent job I had, it was like five lines or something, which is I'm so grateful for. And, uh, but some people wouldn't accept a role like that because it's uh, called an under five and, and uh, it's not, it's below their pay grade. And uh, for me, I just, I'm trying to learn about being on set. I'm trying to learn about what every single person's job is on set. Like I'm almost approaching this like a director because I want to understand it so well. So any opportunity I can get to be on set, I take it. It doesn't matter what the role is. It doesn't matter. It, 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 it's anything. Like I'm just so honestly happy to be there and happy to be a working actor. Uh, okay. I know I'm going all over the place. The but... What? What was the role that you're referring to about like the, the big, the oh, big break? Yeah, that was the Mind Hunter, the, the show that I did on uh, the Netflix show that I did. It, it was like one scene, but it was a really good scene. And was that the David Fincher one? Yeah. What was this season two? Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen season two yet. Because I, like, I, I watched the whole first season. I was like, I didn't see it. That's awesome. Okay, it's so. very good. I mean, like, this is one of my favorite shows. And I had watched season one thinking, oh, my God, this is the kind of work I want to do. Uh, and that's the other thing. When you say that kind of thing, you have to be careful because it always, it, it, a lot of the times it ends up happening. Like, if you actually say, I want to be on that show or I want to do, that's the thing I want to do. And I don't mean to be all woo woo. It's just, I think it's because you're setting your sights on something and you uh, consciously or subconsciously make a path to get there. That's interesting. So, so what sort of, do you have any kind of like spiritual practice or if not a practice, maybe just like a belief system about yeah. creativity or just life in general then? That's, a, that's just one of my favorite questions. Um, I try. I love hearing everybody answer that question. It's so interesting to me, but yeah, I do. I mean, I practice Qigong, which is an ancient Chinese form of, it's kind of like Tai Chi is the way I describe it. Okay. Um, it's like the grandfather of Tai Chi and it's awesome for lack of a better word. I love it. Um, so I practice that. I consider that my spiritual practice and I grew up Methodist. So I grew up as a, Christian and I I'm sort of in the process of where I stand with everything speaking uh, religiously I don't know but I do believe in something and I'm trying to get quiet with myself and listen and maybe find some stuff out I don't know maybe I definitely am a spiritual person I I'm very curious in that, in the other realms that exist or don't exist, but I'm just a curious person. So what can I do? What can you do, Danny? What can you, you do? Gone, for, by God's sakes, for God's sakes. Yeah. What about you? I, I mean, definitely, I'm, I'm kind of like a cafeteria spiritualist, I think, that I, I try on a lot of stuff and yeah. I have found a lot of benefits from not necessarily Buddhist practice, but just like Buddhist understanding of the world and mm -hmm. something yeah. that I consider kind of like at the core of my being is that, oh, that just like the idea of the no self and that like the ego is an illusion yeah. and that like a lot of the things that we traditionally use to define ourselves end up just being like these emergent phenomena that kind of come and go and yeah. aren't really at the core of yourself 
that seems to me just like a fundamental feature of the universe. And so like contemplating that can calm me. And then, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So it, it, it is something that it, it just feels like so mysterious. And I'm somebody that I have, I think like, like a more than normal amount of synchronicities happen to me. Yeah. And like not even anything that make for some kind of like salacious story or anything, but of just like these little moments of where it feels like the universe is winking at me. And, oh yeah. Uh, I don't always love that language of like the universe, but I think that's just the quickest way to communicate it. You I know? know, I know what you mean. Like it's, it's the only way to describe what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's just extremely frequent. And so yeah. I, I don't, I don't try to apply any kind of secondary interpretation to that. It's, it's just yeah. kind of like, this is an undeniable phenomenon that happens to me a lot in my life. And it doesn't really seem to have anything to do with me, but it, yeah. it, I read a lot into it. And uh, so, yeah, I would just say it's like very spiritual, but nothing definite. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's, that is spirituality, but uh, it, I, it reminds me a lot of what you're talking about. And I'm new at Qigong's very new. So please bear with me as I probably butcher this, but the whole thing is that energy is on a chi field and chi is energy. So I think what you're talking about in terms of the lack of ego, that reminds me of the idea of chi because you are constantly receiving chi and you're sending it out and you're, you're on this uh, plane with everything else in the universe. And, and if it, so that's what I mean when it's like, it, it doesn't, it's not about you anymore. And yet it is all about you because this is your experience here. It's really not, I mean, it's, I started doing Qigong because my doctor told me to get into it for meditation practices, for anxiety, for uh, just some other health issues I was having. And uh, so it's not even, I'm not even doing it because I like want to whatever, be enlightened. It's just, I, I want to be the most responsible version of myself as I can be. And I want to be, that requires a, a steady practice in, in something, which is, which I'm, I'm trying out, which is Qigong. <laughs> That's cool. And so is it movement based? Is that, that that's what it sounds like that? Yeah, it, it is. It is. It's like, you know, you hold a lot, there, there are like three different forms of it. And I'm only doing the first form right now, which is called awakened vitality. And it's just a series of, of movements that you hold for a long time, but it's mostly breath work and meditation. And uh, again, very new, very new to it, but there's also a weird coincidence I've been noticing in that I've been booking jobs more, acting jobs. And I think that's correlated, it's connected because I think Qigong kind of allows me to uh, open up and tap into things. And that's all being an actor is, is opening up and tapping into things. Uh, so I think, I think it's actually helping me become a better actor as a um, a side effect, which is, which I'm, which I'm grateful for. I think that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. I, I didn't know it by the name Chi Gong, but do you know who TJ Jagodowski is? Vaguely. He's, he's considered like just the improviser of all improvisers in Chicago. Right. And he's in the Sonic commercials. I guess that okay. would be the, the main way that people know him, which is so sure. funny because he's such an amazing artist and his like claim to fame is, is sonic advertisements. But yeah. he had us do like a chi ball exercise in this improv class where you, you kind of like rock back and forth on your yeah. heels while creating this little chi ball. And it's crazy because like, if you do this for two or three that's, minutes, you start to feel the ball. In that's it, that's what it is. That's the whole idea. And like okay, lachi cool. is when you're, you can do this like when you're in traffic, it's, it's just uh, bringing energy in and you actually start to feel it and it moves your hands. And what you say in meditation with this is haula, which means all is well and getting better all the time. And I, I just, I, I, it, it's something that's helped me a, a lot when I, before I go to set or before when I'm really anxious about something, just tapping into that is, I'm really excited to continue practicing because I'm a newborn baby at it, but that is exactly the same thing. Okay. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Huh. I mean, that makes me want to try that again after this. I need to like get my chew ball going. 
Oh yeah. Oh my God. Wait, speaking of this, just remind me. So, uh, have you seen the, have you listened to the podcast dead eyes yet? Oh, it's really good. You you have to listen to it. I mean, it's it's very interesting. It's about a an actor who was fired from a Tom Hanks uh, series called Band of Brothers. Have you heard of it? It's like an HBO series. Brothers, but I haven't seen it. And so Tom Hanks fired this guy. It, he's a comedy. He's like an improviser. He reminds me of you, which is why I think you need to listen to it. It's very good. It's about the industry, about acting. Very good. Cool. Dead Eyes. Yeah. Is sorry. that why he was fired? Because he apparently had dead eyes or something? That's what Tom Hanks supposed allegedly said. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like Tom Hanks, America's sweetheart was like, we, we have to, and they fired him the day before he went to set too. Like he was all there and excited and it's fantastic. He has some of the best actors and comedy improvisers on there. And it's, it's just a gem. It's a total gem. I love it. In Los Angeles, I definitely didn't run into anybody like that, but it did, I think, introduce me to so many different actors that I have just like kind of like a radically different way of thinking about it now. That Wait, okay, yeah. You have to tell me a little bit. Okay, I'm really curious about this. What are actors like and what are they like in LA? Okay, so the, the two-pronged question. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think... Very broadly speaking, for actors, what is what is that? I'm sorry, I'm drinking bourbon. It's St. Patrick's Day. Oh, oh, you're right. You know what? Oh, my, my pants are kind of green. It's kind of a green gray. Oh yeah, I didn't even realize I was wearing green until this moment. So I remember you mentioned that, and I was like, oh crap. Oh. Um, okay, so I think that actors in general are people that are just like, um, like like to be not as non-judgmental as possible because I have like a glib judgmental answer as well. No, I, but, I, I yeah, I want the judgmental one as well. <laughs> I, I think in general, actors are just people that are like very hyper aware that most of the things that people do are intended to communicate. And so mm -hmm. usually you can tell it in the voice and that's something that I'm just sensitive to because I am like either attracted or repelled to a crazy degree by people's voices. Oh yeah. So I think a lot of actors, it's like a, a uh, hyper awareness to the way they enunciate. And that doesn't always mean perfect enunciation. Yeah. It can be like Joaquin Phoenix's uh, mumble that is just like <laughs> a, a picturesque mumbling, not caring about the way that he comes off, you know? Yeah. And uh, that I think is broadly the way that it is. And then I think for LA, it's that people... Um, have made so many decisions about the type of person that they are uh, that they don't really take you in. And that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that they're mean because I, I, when I had heard stuff like this before I moved to LA, I just assumed I was going to run into all of these assholes. And the thing is, like, they're not assholes. Yeah. They're crazy because they've made too many decisions about their personalities. Yes, I know so, exactly what you mean. Yeah. It's a lot of just like very contrived personalities and people that are like, that it's like a practiced nonchalance and like yeah. a practiced edge. Yeah. Because you can't, they know, they're smart enough to know that you can't be too composed. So it's no. a composed, not caring, you know? Oh man, that's really well articulated. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And not, yeah. not totally repellent either. Like a, like a lot of it, it's interesting because it's still oh kind of authentic for some of them. Some of them, oh. it's like, that is just, that's your soul. Your soul is yeah. the, to communicate at all times, even in a room alone, you're communicating yeah. with what you're doing. You know what I mean? Yes. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God. That's amazing. It, it's so funny. Um, yeah. I've always struggled with like the identity of, of actor. I don't know why, like, and that's the first time I'm ever saying that out loud, which for what that's worth. You heard it here <laughs> first, folks. Yeah. You heard it here first. Cause it's like, I don't, I don't know. There's this whole idea of what that looks like and I don't feel like I ever was that or ever will be and I don't I can't really explain why but I think I think there's just this idea that like glamour goes along with being an actor and so does having a very uh I don't know what's the word set kind of personality that you oftentimes have to have an idea 
of how you want to market yourself and, and put that into the world and just sell that and push it really hard. But for me, it's always been like, well, I, I do this because it is my spiritual practice. Like we were just talking about this, like uh, this is the thing that I do because it's the only thing that I can uh, think of doing that will bring me this kind of peace and joy. So, uh, so, uh, so the, I've often felt kind of confined because so many people, I remember when I was first starting out, people would tell me that I was milk toast and that they didn't really know what to do with me because I was, my voice was low. I kind of looked like I was in my thirties, but I was in my early twenties and, and they thought, okay, are you the really sweet girl or are you a mom? Like, are you mean? And they just didn't know, like they couldn't figure out what to do with me. So I think that's why I kind of struggled working throughout my twenties a, a little bit because I was in between and now entering my thirties, I feel like I'm ready to uh, enter adulthood and have these roles that I've been longing to play for a long, long time. And again, all of this is, this whole conversation is so roundabout because that's the nature of this field, but yeah, I, I often feel like I don't want to be put into a box and I want to choose creative projects that speak to me and make things that I feel uh, deserve to be made and, and lift other artists up that I believe in. That's like the goal. Yeah, I get that. Well, and it's, it is tough because I think like creative types in general, um, and, and this, this sounds like judgmental, but it's not, it's like they want to be unique yeah and not that they're like diluted in that but it's often very tough i think especially after like coming from the midwest to have this like kind of alternative dream and alternative lifestyle and mm -hmm. then to enter into a community of people where they suddenly think you're very normal and like not extreme enough and right because i i relate to that a lot of like totally. feeling very out of sorts in like the conservative old boys high school I went to yeah to elementary school before that for being too weird and then going into these urban environments where people are convinced I'm like too normal and too too stale totally so. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it, it's always been that but I think that's a bit of a gift because it's you don't get pegged down really early on in your career as a certain type of thing mm -hmm. so you can just state from the beginning, like you can't define me. I just won't have that. I don't care if you know my age. I don't care what you think about my physical being. I'm going to do what I'm here to do. And that, that, that can be quite empowering, that, that mentality. Yeah. And I think acting wise too, there are, I, I kind of arbitrarily divide actors into two ca categories is that there are like actors who play characters. And then there's like the Jason Bateman type. And yeah, I, I definitely totally. consider myself like the Jason Bateman type. And people have told me that I don't do a lot of acting anymore, but people were, have always been like, you know, it was kind of good, but like, you didn't really uh, do anything. You just kind of played yourself. And I'm like, you know what? That's what I bring to the table. Okay. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> That's what I, I think you should start acting again. Cause I, I actually remember you in, in some shows and you were very, very good. And the world needs that. Like we desperately need people like that. Like really good actors who can do that thing. The thing that you're talking about. I, I'm planning to get back into it and this was an enormous bummer because I had such a hard time in Los Angeles getting on my feet financially yeah. and I would just say like mental health wise, immaturity wise, I just was not ready to do the LA performing thing and literally two weeks oh, before the lockdown happened, mm -hmm. I finally got the money and joined a performance class and we got two sessions into it and then they just like canceled it that was like i worked for five years for this and then it, it's just gone but it's like i mean everybody has their version of that story too oh, so yeah. I, I, for sure. it wasn't a tragedy and i think overall it helped me pivot in order to put me on a better course but at the time i was like it was all leading to this and just just went away devastating oh my god did you think in that moment were you like, oh, what, what does this mean? Or were you just kind of like in survival mode? Oh, no, I, I'm always somebody that always tries to put some sort of elevated, like spiritual and literary interpretation of every moment of my life, even the most mundane. So, um, so yeah, I think 
overall, I have hated the pandemic. And I was going to ask you about this too, but this kind of neatly brings it up. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just been this like spiritual bath for me. And, and it's like mm-hmm. really um, made me confront a lot of things that I think I probably would have put off for a couple more years had I not, mm-hmm. you know, had to lock down and be alone in an apartment for several months. So did you go through anything like that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. That's, I still am. It's, I think we're all, I think we'd all be lying to say that we're not uh, uh, struggling right now. I mean, it's, it's a really challenging time. Um, but have you felt that it's like, cause like as much as I hate it for me, this, this feels like I'm really doing the work, you know what I mean? To invoke yeah. that cliche, like, no, I know. Yeah. I mean, well, it definitely feels like I've I've really taken a look at my life with all of this time that we've had. Um, And I feel like I now know that I cannot continue, not that I was living my life in a bad way. It was just, I could not continue that lifestyle uh, and move towards the life that I've kind of always dreamed of having. So I had to like make some changes in terms of my diet and the things that I practice and the way that I think and the jobs that I take and all this stuff and um and having everything shut down for this amount of time has has forced me to do the work as you say because you're so left alone inside of your skull um and so yeah so there's like yeah there's a feeling of nobility to that for sure but it also feels like I'm just beginning and, and yes, it's, it's reaffirmed that I should be an actor. That's, that, that's what I should be doing with my life. But I also have so far to go. I have so much to learn. I have so much work to do in order to do the kind of work that I want to do in my life. So it, it's, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answer, answering any of your questions, but I- I oh, 100%, I, yeah. yeah. I, I, I relate to that a ton of just of it, it being liberating, but then at the same time, I feel the space I'm in right now, I feel very daunted by how at the beginning I feel and how much more there is to do. And I feel like I'm working myself into a frenzy because I don't feel like there's enough time to like mm-hmm. catch up, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, and then there's the whole the whole feeling of like this kind of feeling like lost time where did this year go where I could have been making this thing or I could have produced this thing or I could have booked this job or I mean I was in a play that got canceled I mean everybody that my story is the least sad of, of all the stories but but it was sad to have our whole industry shut down I mean just stop so th- there's there's a lot of that as well yeah no, I, I I get it, and I I I get the mentality too of like realizing it, it's not a tragedy. It's just kind of like I think it's just realizing like how much you really need this kind of stuff. Because totally, I've had the benefit of like working a lot of jobs that are not creative at all, and it's only affirmed mm-hmm. that like I don't know if I'm a good artist, but I'm too much of a whiner to do anything else. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm really bad at it, and. Every job I've ever had involves like one of my superiors looking over my shoulder to see that I'm not working on what I'm supposed to be doing. And like me not really feeling like I I can do anything about that. I'm like, yeah, this this is what it is. I try not to stay anywhere more than a year because I know I don't bring a lot to the table as a worker. And that's what I'm dealing with. Same. I'm so mediocre. I'm such a mediocre person. And but but just not in all ways, but just in all of the ways that everybody else is not. And so I feel like they are thriving and doing their thing. And I thought I was watching Mad Men last night and there's this scene where John Hamm, it, I won't give anything away, but it's towards the end of the series. And he's at a long table with a bunch of other men in suits working on a creative project for an ad for some Coca-Cola or something. Not Coca-Cola because he loves Coca-Cola. It was like diet beer, right? Okay. And he's, they're all kind of talking. One other guy in a suit is giving a pitch for this commercial for diet beer. And it's really stereotypical and blah, 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 stupid, stupid. And John Hamm, there's this moment where he turns and looks out the window and the camera catches his POV and you see this plane flying and leaving this big line in the sky. And then after that, he closes his folder and he gets up and he leaves the meeting in the middle of this guy's pitch. And it's just a really quick scene. But to me, that scene 
so beautifully captures the idea of feeling like you, your mind is always down the street and around the corner from where everybody else's is. And that in that moment of John Hamm taking that in and then getting up and leaving, that was such a, a beautiful win for that character. And, and uh, it, I just think it, it uh, captures what you're talking about, what we're talking about right now. That's an excellent image. And yeah, I mean, I, I relate to that a lot of like, and especially set in a work environment of just like looking out and yeah, oh, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because <laughs> I think that adds to the feelings of insecurity too, because even yeah. though sometimes I find that affirming being like, oh, well, I am destined to do this for better or worse. There's yeah. the other little voice that's being like, but maybe you're just incapable and maybe you just like yeah. can't do this shit. That never goes away. That's, I really think that's something that will always be there, unfortunately, but maybe fortunately, because it also kind of keeps you a little grounded, you know, it's, it's not, not to like say that that's the voice of reason or the voice of truth, because it's not, but um, I don't know, keeps you real. It keeps, uh, you know, it just, it keeps you in check because then you kind of go, okay, I know that's not true, but am I doing all the work that can be done right now? To make this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I feel that. I think I think that like a lot of my biggest creative drives have kind of come out of that like, oh, shit, 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 shit. Because like yeah. when, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I had every intention of working with a good friend of mine and, you know, trying to produce film and do all that kind of thing. And maybe predictably, it fell apart within like a few months of us getting there. Oh, wow, and yeah. It was, it was just like, oh crap, like this was the entire plan to work together. And then we had literally like cut each other out after that. Uh, and uh, that was when I started writing my first book. So it, oh. it ended up being a super scary time, but at the same time, it was just kind of like a lot of that creative energy just kind of came from like a, well, all, like the rug just totally got pulled out from under you. So you got to try something else. Have you ever had any moments like that in your career of like, oh, yeah, constantly. I mean, every time I don't get, you know, book a job, it's, it's because I'm one of those actors who I put everything into every single audition. I never hold back. It's always 110% because that's just what I was taught to do. And so when you do that, a little part of you goes with that audition and is just there. And and so it's hard not to feel that rejection when it happens. But the key, I think, is to be able to feel it, process it, and then let it go. Because then that's a pretty quick process. Because then you feel sad. And then, you know, you don't hear two days later. And you know you didn't get it. And then the sadness happens. And then you let it go. And it's on to the next thing. But I, I think, I, yeah, I feel that all, a lot. And, and then there have been times when I've been... Uh, when I've had, I have had a falling out with a creative person or, or I felt like I was, although that, I don't really feel like I've had a falling out, but I have, you know, there, I've had a negative experience with someone and even that being so trusting in someone and to be so hurt by someone who you thought I had a per you had a personal relationship with that can be can cause a lot of artistic despair uh, when you're young because you haven't found your ground yet and you don't really know who to trust. Uh, so that was a big that was a big uh, loss early on in my career, career, but it taught me a lot, and I know. Uh, I, I am a stronger, better person and also an advocate for young artists to not have to go through the things that uh, a lot of people my age and myself had to go through to put up with. And it's, you just don't have to put up with that shit. That's true. It, it can feel so tough too, because I think especially when you're first starting out and then, even, I mean, even now, honestly, for me, um, and just like moving from different cities and that kind of thing. Yeah. That, you're so eager to work with like-minded people. Sometimes you can project that you're more like-minded with the other people than you actually are. Oh yeah. Because you want to have that connection so bad because that's where the fun is. And mm -hmm. it's so palpable when you're like 
trying to make something work that just like isn't really there. Yeah. Yes. Oh God, that happens. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time or like a lot even, which is fantastic, but it does happen sometimes when you just don't jive with someone. Uh, but again, like I think the key is just doing it anyway, just making it work anyway, because that shouldn't matter above a certain level that shouldn't matter. You just do the work unless it's a toxic person, like actually they have stuff going on. And then that's another issue. Not in the arts community. I've never. Heard no. Of that. Oh my God. Never. Only other industries have those kind of people. <laughs> um, all right. So what are you working on right now? What, what's on the horizon for Samantha oh, Spanos? Pretty. Um, well, I've been wanting to paint a painting of a fox. And I think I'm going to do that because there's a fox that lives nearby and he like runs across our, our little yard every now and then. And so I think I want to make a painting of him. Uh, but I don't know what it wants to be yet. I don't know if it wants to be on canvas. I don't know, like, I'm not exactly sure yet. So I'm working on that. And I'm also, I'm doing whatever job, I'm doing a lot of self tapes and auditions and I uh, am grateful for everything that comes my way. I've had a couple jobs in the past couple of months and um, yeah, I don't, I'm just, and I'm always so happy to do it. So TV, TV, I'm doing TV right now <laughs> and paintings. So I have been kicking around a short film idea a little bit and wow. I think it'd be interesting if you were involved in it in some way. So no pressure, you don't need any kind of commitment right now, but um, yeah. have you ever seen the movie Cries and Whispers by Ingmar Bergman? No, but I love Ingmar, oh my God. I've never seen that, I'm embarrassed. Okay, so, well, I, this is like one, one of the films of his that I've seen, so I, okay. Or, no, no, I didn't say that right. This is the only film of his that I've watched from start to finish. That's what I mean to say. <laughs> um, but I, I saw that and was very taken with it. And I, I won't tell you the whole thing because I personally hate it when people tell you like opening shot and then three hours later. But like essentially it's a movie about three sisters, one of whom is on her deathbed. Um, the older sister is very cold and very withdrawn but sort of the leader of the sisters, the younger sister, not the one on her deathbed, is much more outgoing, much more bubbly, and people like her. And this dying sister ends up kind of bringing them together in such a way that the colder one sort of opens up to the more bubbly one, and then the bubbly one sort of has her illusions of extroversion revealed and ends up closing herself off a little bit by the end of the film. And it's like, it's so well done. It's not like a fun popcorn movie, but if mm. you have any time to watch it and you remember, I'd highly recommend checking out uh, Cries and Whispers. I have a classic film club. Um, oh, I'm in a do. classic movie club that we watch a movie every Thursday night. So I'm going to, my week is next week. So that's what I'm going to pick. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. And if you Perfect. remember, uh, let me know afterward what you think of it. Cause this was one oh, yeah. that I was like, it's a little slow to start as I'm sure you're familiar with like art films. And so like, I almost turned it off and yeah. I decided not to. And I was like, oh, it, it just, it gave me so many ideas. It's like a very relationship driven film, but it, it gave me an idea for a short film that I think Ooh. would be fun. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm all about that. I am all about that. And I'm so happy you're gonna be on the East Coast. That's right. Yeah, you're gonna love be in it. August. I'm really looking more for like a money amount I have before I go than an actual timeline. So it could be between totally. like July and August, sometime in there. Totally. Oh, that's yeah. so exciting. That is so exciting. Well, we can't wait to have you up here and hang out with us. Do you like dogs? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm a bit more of a bird person. And I think my main worry with moving to New York is trying to figure out how to bring my birds there. Oh, you'll be fine. Oh, perfect. Hey, Pringle, look. This is a, this is a little, um, John got me this for my 30th birthday, which was recently. And this is a, these are like bird sound makers. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said what it was. <laughs> Pringle, listen, do you hear? Wait, maybe try this one. Oh, that's the face he makes when he hears another bird. <laughs> <laughs> that
that that gift is so specific. I know mm -hmm. it's well appreciated. Like, I don't think you get somebody a wooden box of, of bird sounds unless you really know it's going to land. No, oh, and it landed. I mean, why do you think I'm bringing, I, I've brought this up on every Zoom I've had since I received it. Oh, really? Yeah, that's why I keep it next to my Zoom computer. It, it came up so naturally too. That's, that's my favorite part. <laughs> it always does. It always does. Um, so good to see you, Danny. It was great talking to you, Samantha Steinmetz. This was also awesome. like we was, naturally filled the time with nothing but sincerity and artistic transcendence. I, I feel like I, I should have been funnier. I, I have that same exact feeling on this channel. People have told me like, you need to try to make it funnier. And I swear to God, anytime I've tried to make any video on the channel funny, it's been terrible. Well, yeah, that's the thing about you can't try to make it funny. Well, it would have been nice to know that before I posted it. <laughs> oh no, you're good. Okay, I want to know what this video is. I want to watch it. Oh, I mean, it's not not entire videos, but just like moments in in videos. Oh, the the yeah. one that I did on Nightwood, which is a fantastic book, by the way. Uh -huh. uh, I think I was throwing so much stuff at a wall that it ended up being like, it, it, it's it's just kind of like it's not even so unfunny. It's bad. It's just kind of like just distasteful. I think. Uh, that's yeah, so I've made a whole career on that. Hey. <laughs> That's why I felt comfortable telling you. Um, <laughs> all right, so yeah, we've hit just about an hour. So um, let's do just like a quick question right here at the end. Doesn't need to be a very long answer. Yeah. What is one of the best pieces of creative advice that you've gotten in any medium? It's a nice meaty question for the end. Don't give up. All right. So I know something that we discussed on this channel today will help you write better stories. Thank you so much and goodbye.